Thank you. Yes, so I am doing a PhD in geochemistry. Absolutely. Um, yeah, geochemistry is what I'm using for the material this evening um, because apparently I'm really like a challenge. Uh, geochemistry in Shakespeare is a little bit niche, uh, but it miraculously is a niche that myself and my flatmate fall into. Because I'm a player who studies geochemistry and she's a player who studied English. So like, between us we have it covered. Like honestly, if I had a euro for every time that we've discussed the complex, nuanced relationship between geochemistry and Shakespeare, I would still be a broke student because we don't do that. Ever. <laughs> or at least we didn't until I found out that this event existed. And even then we didn't so much discuss it as she just took great pleasure in giving me homework. <laughs> like on Sunday I came home, she happily handed me a two and a half thousand page book called William Shakespeare Complete Works, which was just a massive overestimation of the level of research that I was doing. <laughs> um, but we are here to celebrate Shakespeare. Um, he has done a lot for our language. He's given us some great words and insults and phrases. Like, did you know that it was in his play The Tempest that we first had the phrase fair play? And I think as a nation, we have really latched on to that. It's like, we're so cultured. Um, but I think he did miss his opportunity to write a play or a sonnet about geology. Is we are, as a profession, the only people who can actually say in the same sentence, cleavage, dyke, orogeny, thrust, bed, professionally. You get bonus geology points if you can do it without giggling. Um, and we also have a mineral called coming tonight, so you know, you miss that. Um, but one of my favourite words that uh, he's popularised was the word bedazzle. That was from Shakespeare in The Taming of the Shrew. I didn't have The Taming of the Shrew on my junior or leaving certain English curriculum, so there's two things I know about this play. It's called The Taming of the Shrew, and it uses the word bedazzle. <laughs> so I think any context to that would probably ruin the magic in my mind with a little rhinestone covered rodent running around and things. <laughs> Because context, as it turns out, is important. The words you use matter. The order and the number of the words that you use make a difference. And if you want to build on Shakespeare's poems, you need a set of specifically arranged words, and then you need to build those poems into a play. Now, if you replace the word play with rock, poem with mineral, and word with element, you have basically the fundamentals of geochemistry that was concerningly easy. Um, but a rock is built up of a suite of minerals, and the minerals are built up of elements. And in the same way that um, those elements become the fingerprint of a rock, the words are the fingerprint of a play. And geochemistry then is essentially like trying to pick apart the words in a play to figure out things like maybe what condition Shakespeare was in at the time that he wrote the poem. So if I was going to pick apart, um, say, a play where he used the words, thy face is not worth sunburning, which is from <laughs> As You Like It, that's a real thing that he did. Um, I think, I don't know, maybe Shakespeare was uh, sunburned at the time, wasn't he thrilled, thought it would be an appropriate insult. Who knows? Or a play where he used the word swagger, which he did. Uh, maybe he was listening to too much Justin Bieber. We'll never know for sure. Um, I do like to think that geochemistry is sort of a little less guesswork. We do get to use some fancy uh, expensive equipment to probe the rocks. So for my work, I do a lot of work um, blasting rocks with lasers, which isn't as fun as it sounds. Um, they only make really tiny, tiny holes. Um, but I say tiny, the work that I do in comparison to what other geochemists do with lasers is considered olivine abuse. It's pretty bad. So olivine being the mineral that I work on. So if we're using the analogy of minerals being like poems, olivine is my poem. And if that's ever done anyway deep, then that's great because my sap has come from the mantle. Which is what I'm I'm not sorry. Um, but to tell the story, uh, my story with olivine, um, we're going to delve into one of Shakespeare's raw cheer plays, Romeo and Juliet. And it is raw cheer than I realised when I was younger. Um, through my really thorough and extensive research with my new favourite book, I found out that just before that iconic moment where Romeo identifies Juliet as the rising sun, Mercutio is a little less subtle. Uh, he says, oh, that she were an open arse. 
<laughs> but uh, so to tell my story with olivine, I need you all to think of the mineral olivine as Juliet, and the rare, uh, the light rare earth elements as Romeo. And sadly, I'm going to be Juliet's nurse. But what can you do? Um, so before I explain that um, tenuous link, I think there's going to be a lot of tenuous links. <laughs> um, I should explain who Romeo is in this situation. So the light rare earth elements are part of a group of elements in one of those exiled rows at the bottom of the periodic table. And for the purposes of this, all you need to know is that their ionic radius should make them too big to fit into the mineral olivine, so we shouldn't see much of it at all, but we found that we see a lot more than we expect. And um, it's the true forbidden love of our generation, Latin <laughs> and olivine, Romeo and Juliet. Um, but, so as Juliet's nurse, I care, I care a lot about her. And I know that Romeo, in this case, shouldn't be any good for her. And so I wanted to get to the bottom of why they're together. Why do we see this relationship? So I sat down with Juliet and I said, Juliet, what are you doing with Romeo? I mean, he's no good for you. He's a Montague and you're a Capulet. And I know it's none of my business, but I've heard that his ionic radius is too big to fit in your M2 calendar radius. <laughs> <laughs> Juliet didn't say anything. She doesn't often give up information about Romeo. Um, so like any caring nurse would, to get to the bottom of the story, I hit her with a laser. <laughs> and then she spoke. And, then, yeah. and what she said was that, you know, look, you're right, he shouldn't be any good for me, and his ionic radius is too big for my M2 site, but maybe I'm letting him in another. <laughs> <laughs> She hasn't spoken much since, um, so I'm going to need to have a, another sit down and, and a chat with her. But I have learned a lot so far. Um, I've learned that the forbidden relationship between Lanthanum and Olivine can persevere, like Romeo and Juliet. And I've learned that sometimes the size of your ionic radius doesn't matter as much as you expect it to. <laughs> Thank you.